This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From beautiful design templates and custom domains to full-blown e-commerce, email campaigns, and powerful analytics that you can set up in minutes, Squarespace is the place to go for all of your website needs. Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant, and today I want to share with you a relatively quick take on Sony's just announced video-centric ZV-1. It's a camera aimed squarely at millennial and Gen Z content creators, people who are apparently less interested in things like f-stops, autofocus points, or bokeh per se, than they are in just getting their videos up quickly, yet with higher production values than they might easily obtain with smartphones. In other words, people who, like me, hair and chronological age notwithstanding, appreciate the no futz zone. But hold that thought. First, what is the ZV-1? in practical terms. Well, when you get right down to it, from a mechanical, optical, and business perspective, electronic perspective, at a moment when COVID-19 has so gutted the global economy that it's hardly a stretch to say the camera industry is in freefall, it's fair to say that the ZV-1 is a repackaged, reconfigured, reduced price amalgam of the RX100 5 and 7. Now, Sony has not yet made a ZV-1 available to me in hand, but I have owned or used more than a couple of versions of the RX100, so let's start with that. The ZV-1 shares its internals with the RX100 5 and 7. Same 1-inch sensor and processor, which punch way above their weight class. Super crisp 4K recording, S-Log 3 and 2, HLG, though only 8-bit 420, which is fine, more than fine for its intended purpose and audience. Burst rates for stills up to 20 frames per second, which is incredible. Video frame rates up to 960 frames per second, though image quality is severely compromised at that point. I wouldn't recommend it. Still outstanding autofocus, including IAF and real-time tracking. Same active steady shot as the 7 in 4K, combining optical and electronic image stabilization at the cost of a 1. call it 2, 1.2x crop. Manageable at the wide end, but only just. If you shoot selfie videos at 4K by holding out the camera at arm's length, that full-frame equivalent field of view that used to be 24mm is suddenly that of a 28, and that's pushing it. Speaking of field of view, the ZV-1 ostensibly sports the same lovely little built-in zoom lens also found in the 5, which also punches above its weight class. It's the Zeiss Vario Sonar, nominally 9.4 to 25.7 millimeters, with a variable f1.8 to 2.8 aperture, the full-frame field of view and depth of field equivalent of a 24 to 70 f5 to f8, give or take. Though is it really? At least in the press photos, the ZV-1's lens isn't quite as wide as the 5's. So I'm not sure it's the identical lens or optical formula, though a difference of half a millimeter is pretty much like the difference between, say, Sony's full-frame 24mm and the Zeiss Batis 25. At least as far as field of view is concerned, at least in 1080, because at 4K with that crop, if it's 94 millimeters and not 8.8, .8, the ZV-1 offers the full-frame equivalent field of view of a 30 millimeter, and that's tight. Moving on, same three-stop internal ND, I think, number of stops to be confirmed, present in the 5 but removed in the 7. Unfortunately, the ZV-1 also shares with both predecessors the same menu system and touch interface. Hold that thought. The body, however, is new. The RX100 form factor has been successfully, in my book, reimagined for video-centric content creators and executed within a fairly short time frame, existing parts bin and budgets, ours and theirs carefully considered, to which I say, kudos, Sony. Product management is a tricky business, and I think they've made significant, if long overdue, changes, along with a couple of interesting enhancements through well-reasoned trade-offs. But... Before we go into the details of that body, I do want to give a shout out to the good folks at Squarespace and thank them for making this episode possible. With their elegant layouts, click drag and drop interfaces, customization tools, and excellent support, Squarespace makes it a cinch for photographers and content creators, really any small to mid-sized businesses in any industry, to have an outsized presence on the web. Squarespace can literally have you up and running in minutes with a beautiful website and custom URL tailored to the way you want to present yourself. They really understand what it takes to build your online identity and grow your business. When you're ready to move beyond your basic site, Squarespace has you covered with their fully integrated platform. We know. Not only do we use Squarespace for our production company, blog, documentary, and personal photography websites, I think we've got half a dozen of them, but we've integrated email blasts and e-commerce. We book our street photography workshops through Squarespace. We sell our brand new Streets of New York book through Squarespace sites. It all just works. 
Now that the book has arrived and we've begun shipping, we especially appreciate the third-party integrations available through Squarespace like ShipStation.com. We're using that to print postage, automatically post back to Squarespace tracking numbers and shipping status. Less futzing. So hop over to squarespace.com slash you for a free trial and get 10% off your first website or domain purchase when you're ready to really give it a go by using the discount code Hugh. Again, that's squarespace.com slash you and discount code H-U-G-H at checkout. Thanks, Squarespace. Okay, the new body. The video record button is now where it should be on the top plate and big. Yay! Every single time I've used an RX100, I've been unhappy about that tiny, flush-mounted, kitty-cornered record button. The rear panel is finally in the form of what we might call a traditional flippy screen, as it should be for solo video creators. Side hinge up to 180 degrees away from the body horizontally, tiltable up to 90 degrees, though I don't know if that's in both directions. Which means, unlike the RX107, you can use a tripod without losing access to the screen, including their nice little GP VPT 2BT wireless shooting grip. Sony's gone further. They've sought to improve audio quality by delivering a built-in three-capsule digital mic, which should yield much better sound, but it comes at the expense of the 7's built-in flash, as in, it's gone altogether. Still, conceived as a video content creator tool, I think this is a smart trade-off for the ZV-1, if the new mic performs. Though, frankly, I've never been a fan of onboard mics. I much prefer labs. But if this mic is as effective as the ECM B1M digital shotgun mic I tried with the A7R4 when both were released simultaneously last year, I might have to change my mind. To be determined, though by the way, the ZV-1 also comes with a detachable windscreen, call it a dead kitty, a nice and useful touch, which reminds me of nothing so much as the one that comes with Rode's Wireless Go. I just hope it fits more securely. The good news is that in either case, the rejiggered body retains the option of a lav like the road, or shotgun if you're less dogmatic about it than I am, not only by carrying over the 3.5mm mic jack of the 7, but by retaining the multi-interface shoe now relocated where the EVF used to be, as in, right, no EVF either. But once again, given its purpose as a video creator's tool, I think it's another smart trade-off. This also means that one has the option, for example, of using Sony's UWP dual-channel wireless receiver, and that makes the ZV-1 an intriguing tool when a content creator wants to have a guest on at the same time, millennial, Gen Zer, or boomer alike. Sony also managed to add a front-facing tally light, which is very nice to have. On the other hand, like its sibling, the ZV-1 is not weather-sealed. There's still no headphone jack. There's still no USB-C port. I understand the small real estate available for these things, but these are just some of the things that lead me to conclude the ZV-1 is a kind of one foot in, the other foot out kind of product. We will speak more about this. But with the basics out of the way, let's now turn our attention to the new, yeah, not really new features that most directly target the demographic for which Sony has designed this camera. I'm talking about what they call background defocus product showcase, face priority auto exposure, and what they're calling advanced color science, specifically for a wider array of skin tones. I will take these in reverse order. If you're familiar with color science, you probably know that Sony is occasionally criticized for unpleasant colors. Some people lament Sony's color science specifically when it comes to skin tones. They got that feedback. Others have championed Sony's color science, to be fair, asserting that it is technically more accurate, say, than Canon's, which is known for its color. Some people see a slightly green tint in Sony colors, and I am one of those people. But I don't think it matters one way or the other unless you're doing multi-camera shoots across brands, and then it does, I know. My experience is that Sony colors do look the least pleasing when I'm in mixed company, so to speak. But in the real world of solo video creators, where Sony wants to play with this particular camera, the color of even the previous cameras was fine as long as one didn't immediately put it up side by side with Canon like a Fujifilm or Hasselblad. So maybe Sony has done something different here to be determined. That Sony has taken the criticisms on board, however, telling us during the press briefing that they understand how diverse skin tones can be and that they're responding to feedback is a great thing. So kudos again. 
Kudos are also due for their new face auto exposure option. This is precisely what you want when you're vlogging from your fast moving skateboard and pass under a bridge, road, or other sort of tunnel. Rather than average out the scene and throw your face into utter darkness as it tries to expose for the background, it keeps you from being crushed automatically, continuously. That didn't come out quite right, but you know what I mean. Anything Sony does to make things simpler, in fact, I applaud. Let's now turn to what I initially assumed were the two most intriguing and game-changing features of the ZV-1 background focus and product showcase. <sighs> when I first heard background defocus, I immediately thought the ZV-1 was going to be the first dedicated camera, of which I'm aware, the first camera of any sort, including smartphones actually, to crack the code of computationally rendered bokeh for video. This would have been huge, and I was not the only one thinking this way. It will be huge someday. I think this one feature, along with the even smaller folded optics, will absolutely be the final nail in the coffin, not only for point and shoots, but for most low to middle end crop sensor, possibly even full frame interchangeable lens cameras. But I should have known this was not to be when Sony said same internals as the RX 105 and 7, because that's not nearly enough horsepower in a body with insufficient heat dissipation anyway. Which also means don't expect to make long form videos even now, especially if you use your smartphone as a remote monitor and controller, even if the 30 minute limit was lifted and I don't remember if it was. Instead, background defocus is a switch. I didn't quite get whether it's a menu choice assigned to a function button, a default function button, or something else, which automatically sets the lens's aperture to its maximum at whatever focal length you've dialed in. In the end, it's little if anything more than a variant of the portrait mode icon on older cameras. Possibly useful, especially if the content creator doesn't understand the foundational principle of photography, the exposure triangle, but pretty disappointing in either case. The second new but not really function is called Product Showcase, and again, I see the merit in insulating the non-technical creator from the complexities of underlying autofocus technology. In this instance, we're talking about autofocus settings for whack-a-mole video sequences. You know, like this. Which I admit is quite welcome and a portent, I hope, of things to come. It's basically Sony tweaking its autofocus settings for a very specific use case, one which we personally rarely use, of showcasing a product by holding up something in front of you. Interesting that in the video example they used during the press briefing, a young woman showcased a new lipstick. So much for me being a relevant data point, but it's okay. I'm used to being a statistical outlier. Still, it is impressive that Sony is exploring how to set up their own cameras for more granular, specific use cases for a market less interested in gear than results at a more accessible price point, obviating the need for a major cachectomy or futzing with the usual two sliders for stickiness and autofocus speed on the one hand and autofocus mode, autofocus size and location on the other. The only questions are, one, does the ZV-1 successfully address the pain points Sony identified, again, I want to give them credit through market research, which they categorized as suboptimal focus, color, stabilization, sound, and user interface for an audience less interested than ever in the technical details, and two, did they get the price right? Again, to be determined. The ZV-1 will be available in just a couple of weeks, beginning June 11th, at an introductory price of 750 bucks, rising to 800 after June 28th. That introductory price is $100 less than the currently discounted RX 105A and a whopping $450 less than the currently discounted RX 107. For video content creators, I'd guess, yeah, that's pretty compelling, especially if those content creators were already thinking about getting an RX 100. The real question, however, is this. Has Sony transformed the RX100 variant into something simple enough, inexpensive enough, and better enough for a video creator with what in the end are fairly simple needs to incur the cost and the essentially unmitigated complexity of the RX100's menu system and software interface? Is it worth it, in other words, to move beyond that creator's iPhone, Samsung, Sony for that matter, whatever, when an $80 wired lav plugged right into that smartphone will probably yield as good or better sound. And shoot 4K with autofocus up to 240 frames per second that just plain works through up to three different lenses this year, who knows how many next year, and how soon after that will meet or exceed the ZV-1's shallow depth of field through computational imaging. I don't know. I think 
The ZV-1 indicates that Sony is only dipping a toe into the water with the ZV-1. It is not the full-on smartphone counterpunch for which one might have hoped, but really, who can blame them? That's not any water. That's hot water, where committing to wholesale change and the expense that entails runs contrary to the kind of cautious business judgment a decade-long decline in camera shipments followed by the even more disastrous once-in-a-lifetime era of lockdown demand. Now is not the time, one can well argue, for radical, they didn't know they needed it until they saw it, innovation. And I'd be inclined to agree. What I can tell you is that in the couple of days I've had to think about it, I definitely can see it being adopted by YouTubers who want to travel light, though. Who wants to travel right now? As we wrap this up, I find myself thinking, actually, you know what? I'm thinking the ZV-1 is Casey Neistat's Canon 80D 2020 style. A one-inch mirrorless body with integrated zoom for mobile, energetic YouTubers that is smaller, faster, lighter, simpler, better, better autofocus, better video, better frame rates, blah 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 and keeps the flippy screen. And when I think about this, I see the ZV-1 as Sony's tacit recognition that those of us who can't afford an 80D or 90D body and lenses, or an A6000 and lenses, who in either case don't want to carry that weight, don't want to deal with that complexity, don't have to don't need APS-C, certainly don't need full frame. Within three years, most of us won't want to. In fact, this is already old news. This is not rocket science. We're already there. Thanks again to Squarespace.com for making this episode of Three Blind Men and an Elephant possible. For all of your website needs, if you're a small or mid-sized business, a solopreneur, Squarespace is the place to go. Get your free, no-strings-attached 14-day trial at www.squarespace.com. And if at the end you decide you really love it and are ready to go for it, save 10% by using the discount code HUE at checkout.